Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and today our topic is 10 random thoughts about training, coaching, and professional development. First and foremost, thank you so much for tuning in, my friend. Truly appreciate it and excited to have you here. Uh, Second, before we get into the show, I want to give you a quick recap of the last couple weeks. I've been getting a lot of emails, DMs, people just wondering, yo, Mike, what have you had going on lately? It seems like you've been everywhere. And yes, it kind of feels like I have been everywhere. So the last couple weeks, in a nutshell, uh, had an amazing week. Uh, First week in April on spring break, just great to decompress spend some time with the family, got to see one of my best friends, Wes, and his family, uh, and just get a week to kind of chill out, relax, and not think about work. So that was really great. Came back, and then the next like nine days were an absolute sprint because I had people prepping for training camps. I had my regular athletes in the gym. I still have a couple Gen Pop clients that were in as well. So everybody tried to get in in this little like nine-day window on top of all the stuff that I had just because I had taken a vacation for seven days. So got through that last Wednesday, just an amazing experience. Got to go uh, with my daughter, Kendall, to Camp Tecumseh. I was a chaperone. Uh, So I made the trade. I got to hang out with her uh, a lot. Got to spend some time with her and just watch her do her thing, be a young kid. Uh, The trade-off was I had to chaperone uh, about 12 seventh grade boys. I was (laughs) a male chaperone, so I had to stay in the cabin. And really my only job for two and a half days was to be in that cabin from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. and make sure they actually got some sleep. So uh, it was worth it, absolutely. Just hanging out with her and her friends and just getting that extra time uh, outside of, you know, the four walls of our house and outside of soccer and just seeing her around her school friends was just a really memorable experience and one that I will remember forever. So also (laughs) did my best not to embarrass her. Uh, I think overall her friends think I'm pretty cool. So... I was proud of myself for that. So wrap that up Friday, came back, which is about an hour and a half drive. Uh, I tried to take like a 30 minute nap and then proceeded to go get a haircut with Cade, go pick up the dog from the groomer, come back, pack my stuff, immediately went to a soccer game for Kindle that night. When that was done, had to jet up to Fort Wayne, crashed at my buddy Wes's house again. And all this was because I spoke at a seminar on Saturday morning. So I'll talk more about that later on, but awesome event. It was great hanging out. Um, You know, got to not only present at 9am, but I also got to just hang out for a couple hours and listen to the other speakers, which I really enjoyed. But then when that was done, came home, chilled for a little bit. Kate had a baseball game that night and then wake up on Sunday and Kendall actually had a soccer game that morning and then had like a friendly match. She didn't have to do it on Sunday, but she's loving the game right now, loving soccer. So she went ahead and did that. So yeah, I mean, it has been a crazy couple of weeks, but I feel like finally, yes, we're busy, but for the most part, we are stable here. We don't have to go on any big trips or vacations or anything like that that's going to take us away for an extended period. So just feeling thankful and blessed. Everybody's happy, healthy, and all is good. Now, let's talk about today's show, shall we? I've got some really fun topics to talk about. And essentially what I wanted to do today was I started thinking about like truths about coaching or maybe unpopular truths about coaching, but then it kind of kept spiraling and I kept thinking about these, these same recurring themes or these same recurring topics. So that's what we're going to cover here today is 10 random thoughts about training, coaching, and professional development. Now I'm not going to do a proper sponsor for this show, but if you want a sponsor or something to check out. If you're interested in a live and interactive environment, setting, course, whatever you want to call it, consider attending my Complete Coach Seminar. It's in June 21st, 22nd, 23rd in Chicago. Uh, I only do one, maybe two of these a year. It's most likely the only one I'm going to be doing this year, uh, just looking at my calendar and what I have going on. So if you want to learn, if you want to have a good time and just level up as a trainer or coach, be sure to check that out. And again, I will mention that a little bit more later on. But Without any further ado, let's dive in and let's talk about random thoughts. Starting with number one, we all suck at the start. (laughs) And you know, I like to be positive. I like to make sure that everybody feels good about themselves and walk away, you know, a little bit, days a little bit brighter, a little bit more upbeat. But, you know, when I was coming up, I sucked. You know, a lot of people would say, no, no, Mike Robertson, he probably knows a thing or two about training or coaching or program design, but 
you know, look, I thought I knew a lot when I was coming up. I didn't think I knew it all, but I thought I knew a lot. And unfortunately, I thought I knew a lot more than I actually did. And so I just clearly remember as I was coming up, as I was starting to coach more people, as I was starting to get more reps, I thought I was very clear that, you know, I was a power lifter, but I wasn't going to train people like power lifters. And so I, I really beat this drum and I really thought I could distinguish the two. But looking back, I absolutely could not, right? If I had a fat loss client, they were going to squat, bench and deadlift. If I just had a gin pop, you know, client that wanted to just get a little bit healthier, move a little bit better, they were going to squat, bench and deadlift. And it was always the competition style lifts. I couldn't fathom, you know, doing a front squat. A goblet squat wasn't even a thing at that point in time because Dan John wasn't talking about it. But you know, I literally look back and I cringe because whether it was my programming, my coaching, all of it, I pretty much sucked <laughs> early on. And you know what? If you're a young coach, you may not even know it. You probably suck too. But here's the thing. That's okay. You're supposed to suck when you get started in this industry or any industry, right? Like you don't even know what you don't know yet. So the way I think about attacking this and what I tried to do uh, again, not knowing any better, but I always had this mindset of like, I want to level up. I want to get better. So something that I would implore you to do is to think about making these sprints in the short term, right? We all know we can't sprint forever. Like if I asked you to go out in your yard or in your street, wherever you live and sprint as hard and as fast as you can, you're not going to make it very far, but you can do it. And then you can take a little break and then you can go again, right? So that's how I want you to think about this, right? It's not going to be a steady state thing, but I want you to really try and push each and every day. And I want you to think about, hey, what are some ways that I can level up? Maybe it's reading more articles. Maybe it's listening to podcasts like this one. Maybe it's watching videos and not just, you know, the TikTok and Instagram, like little short pithy stuff. Find longer form videos that really help educate you. But here's the thing, and here's where most people kind of lose track of this. They think, oh, man, I've been working so hard. Okay, how long have you been doing it? Oh, like the last six, seven days. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. So think about sprinting in the short term, trying to learn as much as you can, but don't expect those results to come until later. You know, it may be six months or a year. But when you do this, right, when you have this contrast of sprint in the short term, but look for the long term payoff. I guarantee if you look back in a year or two or three, you're going to be a totally different coach at the end of that. So don't worry about it. If you're just starting off, if you're new, or if you've been doing this for 20 years, just remember the fact we all suck at the start. That's okay. It's not where you start. It's where you finish. Number two, it starts with caring. And, you know, this is something that came up in my talk actually this weekend. And I was just talking about how when I got started, I was actually, well, first two years, I'm at Ball State, right? I'm kind of living that double life. I'm like one part research assistant, one part strength coach. So after I get past that, the next three years of my career, I spent in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I was doing a lot of rehab. And it's kind of crazy to think about now because I had zero interest in rehab going in. I had almost zero experience working in rehab going in. So this was not uh, exactly a situation where I was set up for success. But what I did have was a lot of care, right? I truly cared about the people that I worked with, you know, and, and I can look back now and just very fondly remember a lot of the friendships and the relationships I made during my time there. And, you know, look, even probably not having the best skills, right? The best clinical skills, whether it was assessment or program design or coaching and queuing, I still got pretty good results. And I think a big part of that was just the empathy that I showed, you know? And I think what what caring does, what empathy does, and, and having this, this mindset of, I am a servant to these people and I'm gonna help them in whatever way I can, caring gives you time to upskill yourself as a coach. So coming back to point number one, I sucked at the start, but I cared a whole lot. And I really wanted to see my people get healthy to succeed, to go back into, you know, whatever sports or activities they enjoyed in life and thrive, right? I mean, I had runners, I had gardeners, I had basketball players, softball players. I had this broad mix of people 
I just wanted to help them get back to the things that they enjoyed. And so I think what caring did was it gave me enough time and enough reps to figure out what did and didn't work. And I think that's a big part of this. You can't fast track experience, right? You can learn as much as you can. You can read books and attend courses and listen to podcasts, but you can't fake reps. You have to get that experience. And I think that's what caring did for me is it gave me time to upscale myself as a coach so that I could ultimately grow into the coach that I am now. And, you know, in this weekend's seminar, this gal, Lauren Tate, uh, an amazing presenter. She came on after me. I really enjoyed her talk. She talked about emotional intelligence. I didn't even know this had a word or this had a term, but that's how she described it. She said, you know, part of the reason Mike was probably successful early on is because he has a lot of emotional intelligence. So I was flattered, but also keen to learn more about this because it's something that I've always tried to do, but hadn't really studied in depth myself. So something to think about ways you can show empathy, right? I think just a couple practical strategies that you can take away from this. Um, do your best to learn about the human, right? But also learn about things that are important to the human. So when I'm talking to somebody, I love not just learning about, you know, themselves and their body and what's going on, but like, what are all the other things they're excited about, right? Maybe it's movies or music. Maybe they have kids or grandkids. Um, maybe they really like, I don't know, Star Wars movies, whatever the case may be. I like to learn as much as I can about the human because I find even if they're having a bad day, we can talk about something else. And by virtue of that, we can kind of redirect their focus. You know, let's just say somebody has knee pain. Okay, well, let's not focus on the knee pain. We'll do what we can with our exercises today. We'll try and get you moving and feeling better. But let's talk about something else. Like what's something great that's going on in your life? How is business? How is school? Um, how are your grandkids? Whatever the case may be, you find other things to refocus their energy on so that, hey, now they, before you know it, they've got through the workout. They're like, oh, I'm really glad I came in today. I was going to skip, but now I came in and I feel better. So that is the goal. Okay. But I think it all starts with caring. The more you can care for your clients and athletes, the better success you're going to have. Number three, invest in yourself and others. And you know, I'm not going to belabor this point, but I hear a lot of people on the internet these days. And some people are like, oh man, you got to just really invest in yourself. You are your number one investment. I agree. Got to invest in yourself. Other people will say, oh man, you got to pour into others, especially as a trainer or coach. You got to give everything that you can. And while I don't think either of them is wrong, I don't think either of them are inherently right by themselves because what they try and do is create this contrast of it's one or the other. And I don't think that's the case. I think ultimately the best trainers, the best coaches, the people that see long-term over decades invest in both, right? They understand that you have to invest in yourself, right? You got to level up your own skills, your own knowledge base. You need the X's and O's that are going to help take you to another level. So maybe that's learning more about program design. Maybe that's getting better at your coaching and cueing. Maybe it's filling in a big knowledge gap, like becoming a better speed coach or a better conditioning coach. But once you've done some of that, and I always think of it as like, you know, do some of this, a little bit of that. When it comes to that, you know, this is like the everyday stuff. And again, it's investing in others, right? And it's helping them understand each and every day that you're committed to their success. And sometimes that's just showing there, showing up and being there for them. And that's a huge part of it. Uh, sometimes it's going a little bit further. And I know there are certain clients uh, that need a little bit more motivation from time to time. You know, I got to shoot them a text or, hey, you know, haven't seen you in a couple couple days or a couple weeks. What's going on? How's the body feeling? When, I, when am I going to see you again? But I want you to, to remember, like, it's not an all or nothing proposition, right? It's not one end of the spectrum or the other. The best coaches, the best trainers in the world are constantly investing in both. They're investing in themselves and they're investing in others. Number four, have a vision and belief. And whenever I think about this, I always think about my time with Roy Hibbert. And man, gosh, I'm starting to date myself here, but I think this was like 11, 12 years ago now. It's been a while. But Roy was really impactful for me for a lot of reasons. Number one, huge Pacers fan growing up. Now to have legitimately one of the faces of the franchise in my gym, it, it was just 
a surreal experience. And to have this guy for an entire off season, it wasn't like one of those where he came into my gym once we got a photo. <laughs> Although we did do that when Joe Dowdell was training him. Uh, he came in a couple of times and we did get a photo, but I was never touting him as, as my athlete or my guy. Uh, but that off season together was really critical. I feel like for both of us, because one of the things that I probably did better than anything for Roy is I was constantly in his ear about how good he could be. You know, as a diehard Pacers fan, I watched every game. I knew the style of play. Uh, I knew what he did well. I knew what he struggled with. And it's not to say the people from the Pacers didn't. Maybe I just had a unique take on it or I was a different voice. But man, I really had a vision for this guy. And I was just in him all summer. I'm like, look, dude, I want you to be able to go in right away, move well, feel good about your body. I want you to feel confident psychologically, like physically imposing, you know, against a, a big dominant center like a Dwight Howard. Uh, I want you to be fit because I think that was kind of an issue early on in his career. He was not in great shape. So what would happen? Well, he would get in foul trouble. And when he gets in foul trouble, he can't contribute from the bench. So I said, we're going to make conditioning a huge priority. And I feel like we really set Roy up. And it wasn't just me, right? You know, I was a part of it. But man, he put in a ton of work. He really dedicated himself to being in the weight room and changing his body. And man, you know, if you look at the first five, six months of that season, he had an amazing start to his season. Tailed off at the end, but man, so proud of the work that he put in. And you can't control everything, right? Sometimes things happen, you know, off the court that you can't control or things happen on the court that you can't control, right? They pick up a guy like Andrew Bynum. I don't know. I don't know all the ins and outs of that, but I can tell you that guy put in so much work and I was so proud of him that year. But I think what it really came down to was having a vision and believing in the person that you're working with, you know, and the way I've always tried to describe this, I think it's even more important with young athletes, you know, as they get older or they rise in the ranks, maybe they don't need this as much, but athletes always need somebody that believe in them even more than they believe in themselves, right? So this is the athlete. This is you as a coach. You're constantly pulling them up right? And in a positive way, like you're lifting them up, like, man, you just did this and this and this, killing it. But what could you do even better? How can we get you to the next level? Uh, and this is something I even try and do with Kendall. You know, we always talk about after a game, hey, what's one thing you feel like you did really well? That's awesome. You did do great at that. What's something you can get better at? So constantly challenging them and helping them think about how can I continue to grow and evolve as an athlete? But I also think there's a flip side to this that's really important for us as trainers and coaches and people that want to level up ourselves, right? You know, who do you have in your life that has a vision and belief for you? And I could just let it sit here and marinate for a minute. You know, if you're in your car, you're listening, pause for a second. Like, just think about your inner circle. Who is there that's going to push you? Or if you're having a bad day, who's going to lift you up? Because we all need these people, right? And there's a, a, a just a role for professional accountability, right? Maybe you're a trainer or a coach and for whatever reason, you're not happy with your body or how you look or how you feel. You need to hire a trainer or a coach. Or maybe, you know, your body comp's not where you want it. Invest in a nutrition coach. If you're in a business space of any sort, right? You're trying to move online, you own a gym, hire a professional or business mentor. You know, at the end of the day, you have to surround yourself with positive people and people that will hold you accountable. There's no replacement for this. If you don't have people around you that are willing to hold your feet to the fire, that are willing to pull you up when you're falling down, man, you got to find those people because it's impossible to do this by yourself. Trust, trust me, I've tried numerous times in so many different ways. You cannot do this by yourself. You have to find the ideal or perfect inner circle for you. And it's different for everybody. This is not a cookbook thing where I, I need one of these and one of these. No, you have to kind of have some, some foresight. What are you struggling with? And then you have to seek out the right people, the right mentors or, uh, you know, mastermind groups, something that will help you continue to level up and grow. Okay. So that's number four, have a vision and have belief. Number five, it's not about you. And again, let me emphasize this. It's not about you. And I remember, you know, this was years ago. I think I just opened the gym and somebody was telling about, oh, you know, this, this bodybuilder I know works out of this gym and like their little 
office sales space is just like pictures of them like on stage and ripped and spray tanned and shaved and flexed and you know, all this good stuff. And <clears throat> what that person told me was like, what they don't understand is that most of the people that walk into that room have no desire to look like them, right? They're not trying to train six, seven days a week. They're not trying to diet 12 weeks straight to look, you know, swimsuit ready or, you know, po whatever it's called, you know, bikini pose ready. Like none of them wanted to look like that. Most of the people in this gym were just average Joes and Janes. They wanted to lose 15 to 20 pounds, right? They wanted to build a little bit of muscle. They wanted to be able to move around and play with their kids without restrictions. And so I think this is something that we always need to remember. And the longer we get into like our, our little silo or our own little world, we don't have somebody to check us, the harder this can be. But you have to remember that most end users, like most general population clients, don't want to be like you, right? They have their own wants and needs. So again, maybe they want to get a little bit stronger. Maybe they want to shed a little bit of body fat. Uh, you know, parents, grandparents want to be able to move around with their kids or their grandkids. They don't want to have, you know, that sore, achy knee or that stiff lower back. They just want to be able to get up and move around pain-free. And I think this is one of the biggest distinctions we have to remember. And this is incredibly hard because if you're listening to this, chances are you are in the fitness industry. Something when you were younger or at a certain stage in your life compelled you to move into this space. And so this is really hard to remember, but you need to remember it. You have to remember that fitness is your life. It is what you do. In some way, shape, or form, you live, breathe, and sleep fitness. But to most of the people we work with, fitness is just a part of their life. It's something that they do so they can enjoy other things or other aspects of their life. So the second you can remember that, I think you're going to be way more successful as a trainer or coach. I'll say that one more time. Fitness is your life. But for them, fitness is a part of their life. So that's number five. Remember, it's not about you as much as you'd like for it to be. Number six, I think this is a big one, my friends, a really big one and something not enough people are talking about. Number six, social media is in the follow-up and connection. So this past summer, right, spring, summer uh, has been really interesting for me because one of the things that I've tried to do over the years with social media is I try and keep it fairly small, right? Like just by default, I find interesting people, you know, oh, I'll follow them or a couple like pro athletes that I don't work with, but I'm just intrigued by them. Um, Mallory Pugh being one, if you follow women's soccer because she tore her patellar tendon last year, um, we, my daughter and I were, I think we were watching the game. We saw it happen, just sucked. It was a World Cup year. She's come back. She's playing this year. So it's just like a like a fan favorite type thing. I would love to see her come back and play at a high level in the Olympics. But not the point. The point is uh, a big reason for me being on social is to create content. But the bigger reason that I'm on social is to keep a connection with my clients and athletes when they're not with me. So here's what I mean by that. Let's say I train a basketball player. And let's just make it real nice round numbers. Let's say they're with me for three months in their off season and they go off to Turkey, Germany, Lithuania, and they go play their sport for nine months out of the year. If I don't talk to an athlete for nine months and then just expect them to come back, like shame on me. There's absolutely no reason that athlete should want to come back and work with me, even if I am the best trainer or coach in the world, because I've shown an absolute lack of caring about what's going on in their life for the last nine months. And I think this is something that a lot of people struggle with. Like they don't want to take the time to, you know, follow up or DM people. I'm constantly like if I'm on Instagram, yes, I am posting stuff, but mostly it's because I've got an amazing guy named Paul. Thanks, Paul, that does a lot of the work for me. A big reason that I'm on social isn't to create the content. It's to follow up and to keep engaged and stay in front of my clients and athletes. So I can reach out to my guy like Ed when he's in Lithuania or Dakota when he's in Germany or Keelan or Taya when they're in Turkey, I can slide him a DM and just say, hey, what's up? Was thinking about you, how you doing? And what's really interesting is I'm doing all this and I've already had two guys reach out to me before the, they've even come back for the off season. They're like, hey, man, I appreciate you always keeping in touch and keeping tabs on me. 
you know, I'm not feeling as good as I would like to right now. I want to get back in with you next year. So these are guys that hadn't been with me for a year or two. I just stayed in contact, you know, kept reaching out, just genuinely caring again, right? It's not like it's a selfish thing. If they never came back, that's fine. But just continuing to touch base with them and check in. Now they're coming back. Okay. So there's another level to this. I don't know if anybody has told you this, but you're probably not going to win the content creation game at this point. I mean, there are so many people on YouTube, on IG, on TikTok. This is their full-time job. They are literally there to create content and hack the algorithm. Good for them. Now, does that mean you don't create content? Absolutely not. But you're really creating content to get engagement with a smaller audience, and then you're there to create and forge a connection. So here's how I would think about this and, and think about like different business structures. Let's imagine there is uh, Johnny Macho, the 300K follower Instagram guy, and then there is you with 300 people with a small local business. 300K guy might have a couple whales. He might have a couple people that are just really like, oh man, I'm going to Whatever Johnny Macho says I'm going to do, I'm going to buy his 14-day bicep blasting program. Okay, that's great. But if you look at what most of those people are selling, they're selling like $19.99 a month general fitness training programs, right? They're just playing a numbers game, and that's fine. For most of us that aren't Johnny Macho and we don't have a 300K audience to, to spout our information to, I would be thinking about, okay, how can I really invest and nurture in these 300 people, right? Especially if it was that small. If it was 300 people, anybody that liked my stuff, followed my stuff, I'd be interacting with them. I'd be DMing them, asking them what questions they have. What did they like about the content? Can I help them in any way? Like, you just got to think, the smaller you are, the more it's about your follow-up and your connection than it is about the actual content you create. Obviously, the content has to be good. It's got to be relevant. It's got to speak to them. But at the end of the day, if you're playing with a small group of followers, that's fine. Really lock in and serve them to the best of your ability. So that's number six. Number seven. This is going to be a fun one as well. Attend that course. Got it? Attend that course. Quick drink. So look, I don't know about you. It's not 2020 anymore. We're not locked in our house with masks on, you know, scared to get near or within six feet of other living human beings, you know, we don't need to be scared of each other and we don't have to do everything through a computer screen anymore. So this past weekend, as I kind of alluded to up top, I got to speak at the Northeast Indiana Sports Performance Clinic. Awesome event. Shout out to my guy, Scott Charlin, for having me. It was amazing. There were a hundred people in there on a Saturday morning. They were eager to learn and get better. You know, very young audience. <laughs> very young. Like I said, how many people here are under 30? And, you know, I don't know what I expected to have happen, but like, I think 60 out of the hundred raised their hand. My mind was blown and I simultaneously felt really, really old, but that's okay because these young coaches were there. They were hungry. They wanted to learn. They had great questions. You know, they wanted to know, how do I get an internship? How do I stand out in an interview? Uh, how do I become a better technical X's and O's coach? So, not only are you surrounded by other great people, but imagine this, when you're at a seminar and somebody is physically talking to you, you're way less likely to be like watching a basketball game, DMing your friends, scrolling IG or TikTok or YouTube, like you're locked in. So you actually learn better. So Shantae Cofield talked about this uh, in a podcast a couple weeks ago, and she just said the real value in attending seminars isn't just the X's and O's knowledge, all that's, although that's important, it's actually being in the room. There's energy in the room, you're surrounded by great people. You're gonna learn better because you're not distracted. So again, shameless plug here, if you wanna attend a great seminar, come check me out, Complete Coach Seminar in Chicago, June 21st through 23rd. I mean, I only do like one or two of these a year, so I have all this extra energy stored up when I do it. I love working with people in real time because it's just such a more dynamic way to learn. It's not just me standing here, you know, on a screen, do this, do this, do this. Here's the origin and insertion of this muscle or when you're coaching a split squat, blah, blah, blah. Not to say that that's bad. <laughs> you know, if you're going to do a cert, I think my complete coach cert is pretty good. Uh, and it's built 
for people that can't necessarily attend a, a live or in-person course. But man, if you have the opportunity, man, get out there, right? It's not 2020 anymore. Like, let's find ways to get back in the game, get back into these live in-person events, because I think it makes the entire industry better when we're working together. There's just more synergy, more energy, and ultimately all of us get a little bit better. So that's number seven, attend the event, attend the course. Number eight kind of goes hand in hand with that, you know, mentor the youngins, mentor these young folks, because last week when Tony G came on the podcast and, you know, one of the first things that I do after the show goes up is I just promo it everywhere, right? I'm on Twitter or X, whatever it's called these days. I'm on IG, I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn. I put it on my uh, circle group. I really just try and blast it everywhere to see who's interested and who wants to, you know, dive into this week's topic or this week's guest. And one of the guys that that chimed in actually on X this time was like, man, I really miss, you know, the the 2000s or late 2000s and early 2010s on T Nation because every week he had guys like myself or Eric Cressy or Tony or Joe DeFranco, Dave Tate, Alan Cosgrove, Chad Waterbury, Christian Thibodeau. It was like a murderer's row of great authors accomplished coaches that were hungry to share what they knew. And so, you know, one of the things I'm always thinking about is, you know, who are young coaches learning from these days? And it's funny, I think Andy McCoy actually talked about this. One of the first things he does when he's interviewing a coach is he asks them, okay, well, who are you learning from? And he'll kind of vet that list and he'll say, okay, these people get rid of, uh, and maybe these are some people to add to your social media feed. So you're constantly filling your brain with high quality information because, you know, if you are following somebody, now you have to like dig a little bit deeper. Are they real trusted experts? Maybe, maybe not. Do they coach real people? Uh, Do they have experience working in the trenches or are they just internet personalities? And again, you just have to be honest and reflective of what's going on in the social media space right now. Like not everybody that's there that looks great on camera or is flashing six pack abs or, you know, has all the bells and whistles and cuts and transitions and, you know, like all the closed captions at the bottom, just because they have great content doesn't mean they are really doing this live and in person successfully with clients and athletes. So you got to remember that. So I constantly come back to this idea of, you know, young people need mentors and guidance, find ways to help them. Um, and, And so this has been part of, without knowing about it, it's kind of been my business model for at least the last, I mean, I've created content since 2001, so 23 of my 24 years, but it's definitely been a part of my business model for the last 10, like very uh, systematically. And it's been very premeditated is that I've always tried to create content regardless of where somebody is at financially. So here's what I mean by that. I'm always going to create free content. Right. As long as I'm doing this and it's evolved. Right. At first it was articles. Uh, I would love to write more articles, but that is just a a time consuming endeavor that I don't have time to do right now. Um, But there's always podcasts right every week for, I don't know, like eight years now, eight, eight and a half years. There's a podcast every week. Uh, Currently, we're in a, a pretty good stretch. Again, shout out to my guy, Paul. Man, we have had a video almost every week on YouTube for a year now. Like pretty impressive if you ask me, you know, cause I would get bored or I'd run out of ideas, but it's not about me. Like that's a big part of this. It's, it's something I'm being pulled or compelled to do. I want to give back. Right. And so I want to give away free stuff. Now there's higher level stuff too, right. For people that, you know, are a little bit more serious, you know, maybe you want to invest in just like my R7 longevity presentation. It's 47 bucks, right. That's not a big deal. Um, you know, I'm working on a, a basketball insiders program. Again, it's going to be under 100 bucks a month, something that's really valuable for people that work in the basketball space. My cert, you know, how much you could spend, how, how much does a college education cost these days? And I'm not comparing my certification to a college education. That would be a little bit silly. But as far as practical application goes, for $800, you know, $800 to $1,000, depending on what payment plan you're on, man, there's an incredible amount of practical information in there. So this is not just about me. This is about an industry-wide movement 
to really start to mentor our young coaches. Because one of the things it's frustrating, but more than frustrating, it's just it, it's it saddens me to see young coaches get in and out of our space so quickly. So many young people don't see training and coaching as a viable career. They can't envision them doing themselves doing this for for years, let alone decades at a time. So if you've been in this game anything more than five and especially more than 10 years, I I really hope you're making a concerted effort to mentor any potential young coaches that might come your way. We need more people like you so that we can continue to lift this industry up. So that's number eight, mentor the youngins, mentor the young coaches. Number nine, hopefully I am preaching to the choir here, a little bit of self-talk as well. Number nine, take care of yourself. Um, you know, I, I'm reminded of, I think it was last summer, you know, I was working really hard, really hard. We were, we were jamming pretty good. We had a lot of basketball players in, uh, I'd taken on a couple new athletes. Um, my kids had stuff going on. There was just a lot going on in my life. I mean, I was working really hard. Normally if I work really hard, I'm also very happy, uh, because I just love my job and I love what I do, but man, I was a grumpy SOB. <laughs> I was not fun to be around uh, for like this week or two period. And I just kind of slowed my roll and took a step back and started to reflect. And I'm like, oh, wait, here's what's going on. Uh, yeah, I am working hard, but I'm sleeping like six hours a night. Uh, I was not training myself or at least not to the level that I needed to, you know, punch the clock workouts are okay every now and then. But if that's like the norm for weeks on end, that's not ideal. Uh, but on top of that, I was taking care of everyone else, right? I was doing this amazing job of taking care of all of my clients, all of my athletes. I was making sure I spent time with my kids when I got home. I felt like I poured all my energy everywhere else and there was nothing left over for me. So something that I have made a very honest effort to do, and I've talked about this, I believe in my like like preview show, the 2024 preview show and my quarter one review show, I'm really getting better about scheduling my stuff first, right? Like I have to take care of myself first because if I don't do that, look, I'm just not as good of a coach, right? I can tell, maybe nobody else can tell, but I can tell. I don't have as much energy. I'm not as enthusiastic. I'm not as locked in, you know, stuff that I normally wouldn't let slide. Eh, oh, it's good enough for today. You know, with my kids, my, my, Fuse is a little bit shorter, you know, Cade for like the 10th night in a row doesn't want to go to bed. Like, bro, go to bed, go brush your teeth. Like, why am I dragging you to the finish line here? Like all the little things just accumulate and pile up. So you got to schedule your stuff first. For me, training, number one. If I'm training, almost everything else falls into place. Number two, meal prep. So Sundays are just meat fest me and not that I'm consuming copious amounts of meat, but I'm generally grilling or smoking a copious amount of meat so that I'm ready to go, right? I do that. Jess will generally do some rice and some veg. Man, that's got lunches for at least half, if not two thirds of the week right there. So that makes life simple. Sleep, which, you know, it kind of goes back and forth. Is it training? Is it sleep? You know, if, I, if I'm training, generally I want to sleep more. And if I get enough sleep, then generally training is better. So they kind of go hand in hand, but I've got to make sure those two things are locked in. The other stuff I can kind of work around, but training and sleep have to be there. Uh, meditation for me every day, uh, huge. Massage, you know, whatever it is that you need to be doing, right? And you know what's most important for you. Think, what things are most impactful for me? What is a... I, like a domino habit or a keystone habit. What's one thing that I can do that moves the needle for me and pushes everything else in my life forward? Once you identify that, make sure that's the first thing that goes on your calendar each and every week. But at the end of the day, just remember, you know, if you want to take great care of others, and if you're listening to this show, chances are you do. If you want to take great care of others, you absolutely, positively, no questions asked, must take care of yourself first. You've got to make time for yourself. Okay, so that's number nine. Take care of yourself. Number 10, this is a fun one. I want to end on something fun, something positive. Don't forget, you have a pretty kick-ass job, right? And, you know, I don't think I ever forget this, but I definitely think as we get older, sometimes the luster fades a little bit, right? Uh, what is the, the John Mellencamp line? 
life goes on even after the thrill of living goes on or something like that. Uh, it's a really powerful lyric, right? Like once the thrill is gone, you know, then what do you do? And I think sometimes it just gets harder as we get older, right? We forget what it's like to be a kid. We forget what it's like to play or to just have pure joy. Uh, and so one of the things whenever I get like this, right, and, and work feels heavy or serious, I always come back to kind of like my guiding light here. And that is to take my work seriously, take my craft seriously in the sense that I want to get better, right? Myself, I will never be a finished product. Uh, I will never be perfect. I respect that. I reflect on that very frequently because <laughs> I take L's at work just like you do. But at the same time, like, yes, I take my craft seriously, but I don't take myself seriously. Right. So that's where I have self-deprecating humor. Uh, I want to laugh. I want to joke. I want the gym to be a genuinely pleasant experience for everybody that walks in there. And that doesn't just go for me. You know, at the gym now, I want Dave's clients to feel like they're welcome. I want Ross's people to feel like, oh, man, that Mike guy, you know, I don't even work with him, but he he's a great dude and he wants to to see me be successful. So I think there is just this element of taking your 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 work seriously in the sense of you want to get better, but not to the point of, oh, man, I'm just miserable and grumpy. And, you know, like that's that's not good for anybody. So. At the end of the day, I always try and remind myself, look, we might have one of the most impactful jobs out there. I mean, I, for, I don't even know what the stats are now. Some people would say 50, 60 percent of the American population is either overweight or obese. I mean, that's incredibly sad to think about. But on the bright side, we get to impact people every single day. If you're helping gym pop clients move better, feel better, shed body fat, have more energy, uh, make them feel sexier for their significant other. Like, that's amazing. How cool is that? You get to help people every single day feel better about themselves. If you work with athletes every day, you're getting the chance to help them build a bigger body, a stronger body, a faster, more explosive body, a more robust and resilient body so that they can go out there and, you know, make the high school team or get a division one scholarship or maybe get, you know, a second or third professional contract. Like, how cool is our job when you sit back and think about it? I mean, it's truly amazing. And I still can't believe each and every day that I get to roll out of bed. You know, I get to put on my iFast basketball t-shirt, some black sweatpants, tennis shoes. That's my work attire, right? I'm not in scrubs. I'm not in a suit. I'm not in, even in a collared shirt anymore because a lot of days this is what's comfortable and this is what I want to rock. So just remind yourself, you know, at the end of the day, don't get too serious. Don't get too down. At the end of the day, we have a pretty kick-ass job. So my friend, that is does it for this week's show. To recap, all 10 in rapid fire order. Number one, we all suck at the start. I did, you did. Don't worry about where you start. Think about where you want to finish. Number two, it all starts with caring, right? You got to care about your clients. You have to show that you are invested in them. And that goes along with number three, invest in yourself and others. Invest in yourself to improve your coaching, cueing your technical skills, but also show the people that you're working with that you're invested in them, that you want to see them succeed. Number four, have a vision and believe. Regardless of who you're working with, try and be the coach that always lifts them up, that sees an even better future for themselves than they do at that point in time. So whether it's Roy Hibbert or Grandma Betty, doesn't matter to me. Whoever you're working with, have a vision and believe in them. Number five, remember, it's not about you. So if you're a bodybuilder, a power lifter, an Olympic lifter, a CrossFitter, that's great. Chances are a lot of the people you work with don't aspire to be you. That is okay as well. Find ways to distinguish your goals from their goals so that ultimately you can give them the results that matter the most to them. Number six, social media is in follow-up and connection. Yeah, you got to create content. Yeah, it's got to be relevant. But at the end of the day, even if you got a small audience, it really comes down to are you creating a connection and are you following up with the people that are most interested in your work? Number seven, attend that course. It's not 2020, no masks, no social distancing. Get out there, my friends. Get out there. It's a great, beautiful world. Attend a course. Hang out with other like-minded individuals. Enjoy the energy in that room because I guarantee it will inspire you and get you to another level. 
Number eight, mentor the young folks, right? Don't let them be tethered to their phones. The person that's incredibly popular on TikTok or YouTube or IG doesn't mean they are the best trainer or coach in the world. So find ways, if you're listening to this show, and especially if you're a seasoned vet, you've been doing this for a little while, find ways to give back to the community as a whole. We need more people like you helping mentor our young coaches. Number nine, take care of yourself. At the end of the day, yes, we want to invest in others. We want to take care of other people. We are servant leaders, but we have to take care of ourselves first. When you don't, everything in your life gets infinitely crummier and nobody wants that, right? Make sure, take time, schedule your own training, meal prep, sleep, mindset, meditation, whatever is most important to you, make sure you're taking the time and scheduling that first so you take care of yourself. And then last but not least, just remember, you have a pretty kick-ass job, right? We have an amazing job that gets to inspire, motivate, and truly help other people on an everyday basis. So my friend, that does it for this week's episode. That is 10 random thoughts about training, coaching, and professional development. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, take two seconds out of your day. If you're not already subscribed to the show, go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube Podcasts, whatever podcast platform you prefer at this day and age and subscribe or hit the follow button, whatever it's called these days. So you know each and every week when a new episode drops, because as I alluded to up front, I'm here, I am playing the long game. And as long as you are interested in what I've got going on, I will do my best to educate you and continue to drive this industry forward. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.